This is the Holland Assets Podcast, where we'll show you how to go from employee truck driver to savvy business owner. And we'll do it together because we're starting our own trucking company, Holland Assets. So you'll get a front row seat through the whole process. Together with some experts in the field, we'll teach you how to set up a business, buy a truck, get your DOT and MC numbers, get insurance, and a lot more. Thanks for joining us. Welcome, everybody, to episode 25 of the Holland Assets Podcast. This one is delightfully called Don't Get Screwed. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this episode. It's something that we kind of teased a little bit on a recent one, uh, but I am your host, Craig, here with Chris. Chris, you know, I expected you to be in studio, but something held you up. You want to tell people why you're not in studio today? I, I really wanted to be in studio. This is ridiculous that I'm recording remotely from what maybe 20 miles away i know it, it's not that far where are you in salt lake right now i'm i'm in salt lake right now and i this this is the first time i've taken a load where i've had to pick up uh, so a three pick load so i'm picking up in three different locations i got it the first one arrived there at like 8 30 this morning it was really quick got loaded the piece there and then drove like three miles away to another location Got there about, uh, or actually, I'd say got here about 9.50 this morning, and it is 6 o'clock, so um, eight hours, and they still haven't even started loading me. Eight hours and counting. It, I got to say, you told me this. I was blown away. You know, obviously, there might be delays here and there. Uh, you know, it's going to take us an hour before we can get to you, and that's frustrating, but eight hours, do they do anything for you? Do they compensate you at all? It's it's ridiculous. Yeah, they they'll I'll get some detention time on this one, but it's you know, it's it's really not worth it. I mean, it's it's nice to have a little something, but it it doesn't account for the lost time and everything that goes into it. It's just it's ridiculous. It's unbelievable. Unbelievable. Well, so that's one way we get screwed and we can't really help it. Chris, you stole my transition. That's perfect. No, that's exactly right. That's, and that's what we're talking about today is ways that you can protect yourself. There's, you know, I'm assuming there's nothing you could have done here. There's no way you can uh, predict this sort of thing. Um, but today we are going to talk about different ways in which uh, in which business owners get screwed, uh, trucking business owners specifically, and uh, some ways to protect yourself. So yeah, Chris, anything you want to expound on before we get started on that? No, I, I just like to kind of remind everybody that uh, we'd really like to get some more reviews. So if you've enjoyed the podcast or even if you haven't enjoyed it and you're still listening to it, um, <laughs> get, leave us a review. Let us know what you like about it, what you don't like about it. Uh, we'd really appreciate it, whether it's on Google Play or iTunes. Um, leave us a review. That would be super helpful for us. Yeah, absolutely. I, I hope people will do that. It's uh, one of those things where, you know, Hopefully you're getting a lot out of it and we're not asking for much in return. Just uh, just a little, you know, hit that star button on there, preferably the one with five uh, five stars. <laughs> but yeah, that, that would be great. Uh, a great help. So Chris, tell me a little bit about what's been happening out on the road, you know, not counting today and how things are going lately. I've been naughty. It, uh, what kind of podcast is this? <laughs> <laughs> not that kind of naughty. Oh, part. okay. All right. Well, what's, what's going on? So I'm going to I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story but I'm going to I'm going to preface it a little bit and give a lead up cuz there's quite a long lead up to this one. Um I was driving from um I think it was Salt Lake, yeah, Salt Lake going to Indiana and um I I I'd, I'd stopped after my first day of driving in Nebraska, I think if I remember right, and was doing my planning, getting ready to go for the next day when all of a sudden I realized that I'm going to stop in probably somewhere around South Bend, Indiana. Well, I've got a buddy that lives in South Bend, Indiana, and I hadn't seen him for like 10 years. We'd gone through um some military training together. And just, you know, kind of hit it off really well. So, you know, one of those friends that you don't get to see very often, but you you, you mesh really well. So anyway, I, I this is like early in the morning, probably midnight. And I'm going to drive for quite a while, uh, maybe two o'clock in the morning. So I can't call him right then and see if he's available. So anyway, I, I let the day go on a little bit. I'm driving, um, call him up and say, hey, I'm going to be in probably spending the night somewhere in South Bend. You want to get together for lunch? 
because that's about the time that I would uh, stop driving. He's like, yeah, that'd be great, but I've got a really tight window today. So we set a time and, and we, we couldn't really go a, a, a half an hour earlier or a half an hour later. So time's crunched. So everything goes really smooth. I'm driving on I-80 and I get um, not too far from the Illinois-Indiana border. And all of a sudden on Google Maps, it shows there's a, a 45 minute delay because of, because of an accident right on the Illinois-Indiana border. I'm like, ah, oh, crap. And that's going to, if that 45 minutes is going to put me past our appointment time when he's able to meet and just it's going to extend me past my clock. I'm not going to be able to stop where I wanted to stop. So I'm, I'm kind of frustrated at this point. And Google has a route that I can take that will take me around the accident um, and, and that delay. So anyway, I decided to take that route. I go around the route. Um, it takes me a little bit north of I-80, just kind of on a not really a rural road, but one that a divided highway that passes through towns. Well, anyway, I'm driving 55, actually 57, which is the speed limit there. And I come up on this intersection. Well, it's one of those spots where they drop the speed limit for like a quarter of a mile. And a DOT officer clocks me going 57 and a 45 kind of just after the speed limit changes. So I get pulled over for a speeding ticket. Ouch. Uh, yeah, what, that, what was the damage? Um, you know what? I, I didn't get a it, the tickets with commercial vehicles are different. They don't, actually don't pay, charge you a fine. But what happened that kind of really makes this story interesting and, and really actually ties in with our theme today is he decided to do a level two inspection. So they don't just give you a speeding ticket. They check your logs. They do a walk around on the truck, make sure there's no issues with the truck he he had me turn on my window wiper make sure the horn work make sure the window washer fluid work and then he's he the next question he asks is so how are your logs and while while we were sitting there and he was doing the outside walk around the truck i went over on my 11 hour drive time oh no and <laughs> yeah perfect timing right <laughs> So, so I tell him that and I said, but wait, I'm going to use the adverse driving condition exemption because of the accident that caused the 45 minute delay. That 45 minute delay, I, I should have been able to make it no problems. That 45 minute delay in the adverse driving condition exemption is, is totally legitimate and it would have given me the, the additional 20 minutes I needed to get to where I was trying to get to in South Bend. And the, and the DOT offers, I was all like, oh no, no way. You can't do that. That's for, for bad weather only. And I said, I'm not so sure that's the case. And so we kind of talk a little bit about it for a second. I said, hey, let me pull up the reg. So I pull up my tablet and I go to, on the internet, go to the government's website, pull up the actual regulation and read the regulation to them where it specifically says that it can be used for adverse conditions that are caused that you could not have foreseen when you started that trip. So a, a traffic accident and a traffic jam totally falls within that, that limit. And so anyway, he could have, he was trying to give he, me an hour of service violation. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I bet he loved that. You throw oh, the book yeah, at him. Yeah, I kind of get the impression that he doesn't get challenged very often on the regulations. And so anyway, to make a long story short, he didn't end up giving me an hours of service violation, even though he wanted to. And he thought he should have been able to because I was actually able to pull up the regulation and show him he didn't know what he was talking about. And I did. And so that's another way that and I see this happen all the time where drivers can kind of get screwed by a DOT officer that erroneously marks them for some kind of citation that they shouldn't have. And and that's where it's important for drivers to at least have a basic understanding of the regulations, but probably even more importantly, be able to show, you know, be able to look up the regulation and, and read it, um, you know, real time when you're going through something with an officer. And, and it's not hard to do. I'm going to include in the show notes for today's episode on HollandAssetsLLC.com, episode 25, the links to the FMCSA regulations and then specifically the, the regulation on hours of service. And it's really not hard, too hard to find those things if you know basically what you're talking about. So I knew that it was the adverse driving condition. I didn't know where it was in the regulation, but I just pulled up the regulation and did a you know a, a find on the the page for adverse and found the reg and read it to him and that's all it took. 
Well, the, I, like I said, I'm sure he didn't love it, but hey, if it works, it works. Yeah, I still got the speeding ticket, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> at least I didn't get an hour and hour of service violation on top of that. And he, you know, he, he let me go on to my destination. Said, you know, you've, you know, that you've got time to. The, the, I was like, I was literally like twenty minutes, fifteen, twenty minutes away from where I was trying to get to. And did you make it? Did you get to have way. lunch with your buddy? I did. Yeah, I, I made it with the exemption. I was only even. I I probably would have made it if he wouldn't have stopped me. I was really close. Um, but with him stopping me, that put me, that put me over on, uh, on my time. And, um, anyway, it, yeah, well, it they, all ended up working out. I ended up getting there, just, uh, got to stop by ticket, the DOT which, guy sounds like an inclement, uh, situation to me. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. That, that's adverse driving condition. There you go. Exactly. <laughs> uh, all right. So. That's one way. I mean, that's a, it's an interesting story. It's an illuminating story. And it's one way, like you said, that you can kind of arm yourself uh, for a situation like that. You want to have this information, not necessarily, like you said, at your fingertips, but, uh, but it's not that you know exactly what it is, but you know where to find it. Um, you know, you can't memorize, a football coach can't memorize the entire rule book, but he can know roughly where to find things, right? Uh, and that's all you need to do. You don't need to be able, you don't have to regurgitate it. You just have to know where to find it. Right. Uh, so uh, the other thing, and I, I want to kind of swing us back toward uh, today's topic, which is don't get screwed. Um, and that's way one way you kind of saved yourself a little bit. But you mentioned on a previous episode, it was one or two episodes ago, you talked about uh, get uh, people paying their UCR and that being one situation in which they can potentially see uh, you know, some unsavory business practices, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I actually have done a little bit more digging into that specific situation. So it was the, it was the UCR unified carrier registration that, um, that we'd talked about. And I dove a little bit deeper into the, the federal trade commission case that uh, I I'd, I'd referenced a little bit. And that situation is just a classic example of the type of tactics these predatory companies use to take advantage of drivers. So I, I actually want to read, um, kind of some excerpts exact right from the FTC's complaint. So wait, wait, um, let me, I let me get this straight, Chris, for our podcast today, you're going to read excerpts from a government document. <laughs> I am. It's exciting, huh? It's riveting, riveting radio, people. Here we go. <laughs> Actually, this is kind of interesting. At least I find it interesting. So here, here's kind of what it says, because like I said, this is like a classic example of how guys get taken advantage of. And, and it's a great lesson. We'll dive a little bit deeper into it. But basically, it says um, the defendants took more than $19 million from thousands of small businesses by sending misleading robocalls, emails, and text messages that create and reinforce the false impression that they are or are affiliated with the USDOT, the UCR system, or another government agency. The defendants used official sounding names, official looking websites, warnings of thousands in civil penalties or fines for noncompliance and threats of imminent law enforcement to trick consumers into using their registration services. They deceptively disclosed the total amount charged without telling consumers the costs, including the defendant's service fees that ranged from twenty five to five hundred fifty dollars or more. Additionally, many consumers who paid the defendant's UCR fees were automatically enrolled without their knowledge or consent in Safe Renew, the defendant's annual renewal program for UCR fees. Wow. So, and you said how many millions? They were on the hook for how? They, 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 they took $19 million, more than $19 million from lots of different carriers and and if i remember right i didn't write this down but the the fine that they received was almost a million bucks and to be honest with you with having taken 19 million i'll bet you it should have been a heck of a lot higher than that they because they probably walked away ahead financially even paying that million dollar fine which is just absolutely ridiculous yeah that sucks yeah so that 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 excerpt that I read from the FTC's website really kind of nails home what kind of things happen here that really get guys into trouble is the companies that do this kind of thing are just completely deceptive. And you, you know what these guys have in common with, with dangerous animals that are in the wild, Craig? Uh, I, I 
don't let them near my children. <laughs> you, you shouldn't. Absolutely. But the dangerous animals in the wild, if, if you notice, you know, like rattlesnakes, for example, a lion's an example, before they attack, typically in, in they they give you some kind of warning. So a rattlesnake rattles its its rattle, um, a a lion roars, you know, wild animals typically communicate to you that they're threatened and they're going to attack before they actually do so. And, and these predatory companies kind of do the same thing in a way. They signal to you through different types of, you know, predatory practices that it's probably not a great company to work with. So that's really kind of what I want to start diving into first generally is what some of those warning signs are. Yeah, sure. So where do you want to start with that? So the first thing, and you, you heard this in the FTC complaint, is they try to make themselves look like the government. And so some common things that I've typically seen is they'll use acronyms in their names like DOT something or other or FMCSA helpful services, you know, something like that that, that makes them sound like they're a government agency or tied to a government agency. Interesting. And, I, it's interesting that that's even legal to put that in your business name. It, well, yeah, it, it is interesting and, and it's definitely unethical. And, you know, that's one of the things that this company got in trouble for. Another thing that we see really common in email marketing or, you know, letters that are sent through the mail is they'll use a symbol or a seal. You know, like government agencies oftentimes have a symbol or seal that looks really official. Yep. Well, these companies will try to mimic that and do the exact same thing and use some kind of official looking seal in their marketing material and and be predatory so one of the things that i'm going to do is in the show notes i'm going to put it i've got an image of the fmcsa slash dot's official symbol so you know what to look for what is official anything else is a red flag to me a, a big one i would think um and then another thing that i noticed from what you were talking about was uh, and you had mentioned this in that previous episode was kind of the scare tactics being used where they say you know hey you've only got uh, you've only got a few more days or even a few more hours left to, you know, avoid this $18 million fine that the government's going to put on you or what, you know, whatever the scare tactic happens to be. Right. Yeah. So they use a lot of those scare tactics. And you, you, you really mentioned all three of them right there. They they'll say you're going to get fined really big or placed out of service. They they use like those urgency scare tactics. It's the final notice. You've got to do it now or you're going to get sent to jail or the price that we charge is going to increase, do it now. So, you know, those, those scare tactics, another really big red flag that they're communicating, you know, these companies are communicating that they're not the most ethical people out there. Okay, so do you have any more examples of how this happens? Because, you know, the, this is just one place, but you're you're kind of telling me that there are several ways that uh, that people kind of get screwed, right? Yeah, there's several several of them that are really, really common. So the UCR is really one of the big ones. The other really big one is your MCS-150 update. So the MCS-150 is a form that gets filled out when you first file for your USDOT number. And it contains your basic company information. It contains a number of trucks, trailers, drivers, you know, the number of miles that you either estimate you're going to run a year when you first fill it out or the number of miles you've actually run for a year it just it has that kind of information and the fmcsa requires you to update that every other year now with that being said there are some states out there that do require you to update it annually when you go to register your trucks but fmcsa only requires it every other year okay interesting and w what else would we be watching out for there so this is one of those, and just like with the UCR, where they they scare you with civil penalties, thousands of dollars per day in fines. Um, you get placed out of service, and the thing that's that's crazy about these is is there's definitely an element of truth in what they communicate. Because yes, you can get fined. Although I haven't, I don't think I've ever seen anybody get fined for not updating their their um, MCS-150, what I have seen happen is they'll place a guy out of service. They'll inactivate his DOT number if they go for a certain amount of time after that two-year requirement. But they send letters warning you that's going to happen. They don't just go right out and do it. So um, again, there's some truth to that. You can get fined or you can get placed out of service, but um, you, you have to kind of ignore them for a really long time before that happens. And, and so... 
with something like that uh, MCS 150, is that something that, uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is you're, you're saying there's a, an element of truth in that. Do people, should people be looking for businesses to help them with that sort of thing? Uh, or, you know, third parties to help them with that? Or is that something that uh, that owner operators should be taking care of on their own? They, it can go either way. They can do it. I mean, it's definitely one of those things that it, if you kind of educate yourself and want to spend the time figuring out how to do it, yeah, you can do it or you can pay somebody else to do it. If you pay somebody else to do it, just be careful of who you use and make sure you don't get overcharged. Like at Motor Carrier HQ, we charge $89 to do it. I've seen people charge as high as 300 bucks to do it. Wow. You know, I, I think that 89 is a is a fair price. I haven't seen too many... Um, lower than that, but I've definitely seen some, you know, it's not uncommon at all to see them, you know, in the low 100s to, to do an MCS 150 update. Okay. All right. Well, let's move on to the next example then. All right. The next example that we see is pretty common is your BOC3 filing. So the BOC3 filing is something you have to file when you first get your operating authority. So if you're if you're crossing state lines for hire, you have to get your motor carrier authority. You get issued an MC number. And along with that, there's two things you have to do. You have to post your insurance filings to the FMCSA and you have to file a BOC3. Now, where we see guys really get screwed with this is they typically, if you pay somebody else to do your authority for you, that's usually most companies will include that filing as part of as part of their service. And what we see happen is a guy that's done that, like they use us or they use another company, and then you know somebody else calls them and say, "Hey, you need to file your BOC three right after their authority gets applied for." And um, the guy is, you know, the person either forgot or wasn't educated that that needs that is going to be part of the service they've already paid for. And they go ahead and they pay for it again. So if you've got somebody else uh, doing your authority for you, um, ask them if they're providing that service. And if they are, don't pay somebody else to do it again. And it's not a huge amount of money. It's usually most companies only charge around 50 bucks to do it. So you're not out. It's not an arm and a leg. But you know, 50 bucks is 50 bucks. You don't want to pay for something you've already paid for. That's a that's a whole lot of gas station hot dogs you could have gotten, Chris. It is a whole lot of gas station hot dogs. <laughs> Another area in that same thing with the BOC3 where we see guys kind of getting screwed is our companies that tell them that it needs to be renewed annually or they charge an annual service to keep it up to date. And that's just not true. You usually only have to refile your BOC3 if you've done a name change and or you've changed your address for the business. And um, and a lot of the times, the company that originally filed your BOC3 for you will do it for free or for a very small fee, just do that little update. So so be careful, don't, don't file, don't go to a company that says that you have to do it annually or um, wants you to pay an annual fee to keep it up to date. You just don't need to do that. Right. Well, the third thing that you mentioned to me before we started was insurance, which actually kind of surprised me a little bit because uh, because insurance is such a highly regulated industry. And so I, I didn't think that there would be a whole lot of wiggle room for, uh, you know, deceptive practices or, or whatever. But do you want to tell me a little bit more about what you mean there? Yeah, so you're you're right on the point with that. It's harder for insurance companies to be deceptive because they are so highly regulated. There's every state has a a department of insurance where you can file complaints and grievances with insurance companies. For so for the most part, they try to keep their nose pretty clean. The one area where we do see guys get taken advantage of every now and again are guys that are just applying for their motor carrier authority um, for the very first time because. You've got that 21 day vetting period that we've talked about. So you apply for your authority today. You cannot have your authority active any earlier than 21 days. And so in that 21 day period is kind of when you get everything up and going. That's when you have to file those insurance filings. But you don't have to file it on day one. If you file it on day one, you start paying those insurance premiums the day you file. So if you you could potentially be paying for 21 days worth of insurance premiums when you don't need it for those 21 days. You probably only really need it for the last seven of those 21 days. Um, and, and that's not cheap stuff. You know, you're talking 50 plus dollars a day in insurance premiums. So the last Jeez. thing you want to do is pay for two weeks worth of something that you don't need at 50 bucks a day. That's That comes out to be a lot of money. 
Yeah, no kidding. Okay, well, I guess those are, what What do we have, three, four things to look out for? And I'm sure there are others. Uh, do we do we want to do more today or maybe uh, have this be a recurring, uh, I, recurring subject? I have a really strong feeling that this uh, don't get screwed is going to be a reoccurring subject because I, in fact, I know it's going to be, I, you know, I've, I want to talk a little bit at some point in the future, some you know episode in the future about brokers and what to watch out for brokers screwing drivers. That in and of itself is definitely worthy of its own episode. Same thing with factoring companies. I think we'll do the same thing with factoring companies and talk about deceptive practices in the factoring world. Um, we need we got to have brokers and a lot of guys have to have factoring companies. Um, you know, they're they're two parts of the industry that you've got to be really careful of. And so we'll dedicate an episode to each one of those subjects here in the not too distant future and and talk to people about how to how to be careful with them. All right. Absolutely. So it sounds it sounds like we've got a few things to look out for. And I guess maybe I'd, I just want to come back to that question that we had earlier, which is how do you protect yourself? And I think a lot of what you've said is uh, education. If you if you know what needs to be done, or if you know the order of operations when it comes to uh, you know all these renewals and insurance and all that sort of thing, if you know just a little bit about it, it's going to be harder to be taken advantage of, right? Yeah, absolutely. And so part of it is knowing what to look out for, educating yourself. And then, yeah, let's talk a little bit about some ways that I've found that are good ways to kind of uh, make sure you don't get into bed with one of these less than um, upfront and honest companies. So I, I think a lot of it just really boils down to doing good research. Um, and there's plenty of websites that you can go to that can kind of help you with that. And my favorite really is Google reviews. You know, you've heard me talk a little bit about this with shippers in the past. When I ever go to whenever I go to a shipper or receiver, I always look up the reviews on Google, see how many stars they've got, read through the actual reviews and, and see what drivers are saying about their experience going into this shipper or receiver. And I think, think the same thing applies when you're looking at using one of these companies to provide you some kind of service. You know, look, look them up and see what their Google reviews say. And don't just look at the star rating and read actually some of the reviews. And, and I even like to read some of the one star reviews to see what bad things are saying about the company. You know, some of the five star reviews, see what some of the good experiences are and use that to kind of make my decision if it's somebody that I I really want to work with. Now, keep in mind, you know, no company out there keeps 100% of its clients happy 100% of the time. So there are going to be some bad reviews, but, you know, the vast majority of them should be good. Yeah, it makes sense. I, I, I actually get a little bit nervous or suspicious whenever I see a company that's got like four reviews and they're all unbelievably glowing. And uh, all, all you're missing at the bottom is like love Aunt Jenny or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I think that's a that's a great point is, you know, look at a company that's got more than, than just a handful of reviews. They need to have a good quantity and the quality needs to be good as well. Uh, let me let me give you a, a couple. I've got a couple more thoughts on the reviews. So sure. I, I think the, the reason I like Google a ton is because it's 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 less biased than a lot of the other ones because anybody can go on and post it. You know, me as a company owner, I can't really influence those reviews. Like Google will not take a negative review down. They won't mitigate the negative review. Like I've even had, you know, because one of my companies is progressive reporting agency. I've had people post a review on my website for progressive insurance and I can't even get Google to take those down. Um, so, so, you know, they're, they're going to be more telling, whereas you go to somewhere like, um, the better business bureau or trust pilot, um, you have to pay for those subscriptions. And, you know, I, I kind of always take those with a grain of salt when the company that is being reviewed has to pay for that service to get reviewed. You know, it, it kind of worries me a little bit. So I, you know, I, I'm not saying better business bureau or trust pilot or bad companies. I would just take what goes on with them with a grain of salt. I, I personally trust Google reviews better just kind of for the reasons I've already talked about. Reviews from the people, right, Chris? I'm, I'm, hey, I'm holding my fist in the air. You can't see <laughs> that, but it's uh... Okay. <laughs> uh, anything else that you want to go over on this subject? No, I think that probably about covers it. 
All right, very good. Well, I like we said earlier, I think this is going to end up being a recurring theme. I'm sure there are lots more things out there and probably a lot more things that you're going to run into in your next, let's see, you've been on the road for six months now. So give it another yeah. give it another six or eight months on the road for your first year and uh, you'll probably run into a few more things that'll spark a little uh, righteous indignation to make you want to do another one of these episodes. I hope it just stays calm as can be the next six months. <laughs> well, it's been pretty <laughs> it's been pretty calm today, right, Chris? Nothing nothing yeah. going on. Just other than me getting upset about still sitting at a shipper for eight you know, hours over eight hours now and still haven't even started loading me. I was just gonna ask. No uh, no motion outside, nobody's come knocking nothing on the window. Going yet? On. No. Unbelievable. Well, good luck, Chris, and uh, I, I hope they start loading you up soon. And I hope next time we can get you in the studio. It's always fun to have you here. So, uh, But go out there, earn that scratch, get on the road, and enjoy it. And to everybody else, thank you so much for listening. Don't forget, at, like Chris said, you go to uh, go to motorcarrierhq.com for some of the tools and the, the things that we talk about, the, the forms and the documents that we talk about. And you can go to hollandassetsllc.com to check out full show notes. We're going to have links to stuff, pictures that, you know, of things that we've described on episodes and you know, all sorts of goodies over there at hollandassetsllc.com. So make sure you go check those out. Chris, any final thoughts or should we cut and run? Let's cut and run. Have a, have a good week, everybody, and we'll talk to you next week. Yeah.